Clearwater fly fishing is a tremendously exciting sport and in this video I hope you'll see something of how the type of fishing is actually carried out and also how the fish behave in the water and how they react to the fly. These types of fisheries are now very common particularly in the southeast in the chalk areas where the water is usually very alkaline and supports tremendous aquatic weed growth and prolific insect populations. Now fish which are stocked into the waters very rapidly acclimatize to a natural feeding pattern and offer a very exciting challenge to the angler to convince them to take his fly. Fish are stocked into these waters ranging in weights from say one and a half pounds up to maybe as much as 20 pounds and the object of the exercise is very much that you look for an individual trout and try to catch that one. Maybe if you watch what we're trying to show you and carry on and practice the art, you may get to the stage where you'll come across a fish like this one, one day. By far the most important work on a fishery is carried out in the rearing ponds. It all starts with the annual production of fry. These here are about six months old and you can see the par markings on them. Only a year later they will be averaging as much as two and a half pounds or maybe even a little more. The daily routine of feeding is a fascinating sight for the angler although it's pretty hard work for the fishery manager. But these very large earth ponds do allow plenty of space for the fish to develop. Fully finned specimens such as these are carefully selected out and allowed to grow on into these ultimate trophy fish. Some of which may even go on further beyond this 10 pound range and produce the ultimate angler's beastie. Fish such as this, long in the body, perfect in fin, and this one weighed somewhere in the region of 17 pounds, the true angler's dream. Our native fish is the brown trout, but it does have a number of different color varieties. They, most often they're a lovely yellowy brown with very big spots. Just look at the margins on this cock brownie. What a beautiful fish. Compared to a rainbow, well, how can you possibly confuse the two? The rainbow is silver, predominantly, lovely pink flashed in the sides and heavily marked with black spots. This fish is a triploid. Now that's essentially a sexless female rainbow. Seen together, you can't really mistake the two. The triploid does not show the same heavy pink flash and has far fewer spots on it. Most often used for winter stocking, the triploid nevertheless is a beautiful creature. But then, aren't they both? What better sight could you have? Let's take a look at a clump of weed and just see what insects we can find in it. The most obvious one is freshwater shrimps. They drop out of the weed all over the place, scuttling through it. Now you might think freshwater shrimps are little creatures which grub around on the bottom, quite sedentary little creatures, but they can put on an amazing burst of speed when they're disturbed from a piece of weed or their bottom detritus where they're living, and a trout will go after them with a decided snap and hit them hard. I think they must really like them. They're lovely crunchy little things. That's the first thing you always see in a piece of weed, but now, looking a bit closer, clinging to the stems of the weeds are lots of little ephemerid nymphs, mostly pond olives. These hatch usually around lunchtime and into the afternoon and can provide very exciting dry fly sport. 
Also there's a few Corixa, I would give them their more common name, the Water Boatman. And that's another uh, very fast moving creature. When we say fast moving, this is something, these insects, they can put on a burst of speed over maybe a foot or so of water. But that's quite a lot if you're trying to eat it and it suddenly darts away from you. Now somewhere in here there should be some damsel nymphs. The damsel nymph is the larvae of that beautiful shimmering blue and green flies you see in the, over still water in the summer months. They're gorgeous creatures, slim, fragile little bodies. And again, a fly which can, or an insect which can produce an amazing burst of speed. Sometimes over two or three feet they'll swim like a little fish, wiggling their abdomen. And trout take them very hard indeed. They expect them, I think, to, to move away from them rapidly, so they go after them and hit them as hard as they can. It explains why you sometimes get violent smash takes using a damsel nymph. Now, as I say, the most common creature in this pile of weed was the freshwater shrimp, or gamorous, to give it, give it its Latin name. And we're going to use a, an imitation of that today, but we'll visit our friend Taff Price, who's the country's foremost entomologist and fly tire and see him tie up a copy of a freshwater shrimp. For a fly fisherman to be considered a complete angler, it is necessary for him to tie his own flies. The satisfaction gained from catching a trout on a fly you've tied yourself is immeasurable. It is one of the nicest feelings you can possibly have. We've seen the freshwater shrimp in the weeds that we've taken out of the water. Now the trout feed upon them. In fact, the trout will feed upon anything. But for the purpose of this exercise, we're now going to tie a freshwater shrimp, Gamorous pulex, part of the diet of the clear water trout. And for this, the materials are basically simple. We need a bit of plastic strip, for the back, some grey fur for the body, some little beads to represent the eyes, some nylon for the ribbing, and of course a hook. In the vise we place the hook and we test its temper. Now to do this we just flick it. Now listen, that is a sign of a perfect tempered hook. If it was under it would bend right round. If it was over-tempered, then it would be likely to snap. Taking our fly tying thread, we wrap the hook, taking the thread right round the bend. Now, an interesting thing about this hook is it's called an old English bait hook. Now, any kind of caddis or grub type hook are superb for this. Now, you notice I put the glasses on there. Age does that for you. There was a time when I could tie a size 32 dry fly. I must have been about 12 at the time. And we we're going to need some hackle feathers to imitate the feelers. Now, any hackle feather will do, but we're going to give you this shrimp an international appeal. These feathers come from Spain and they're from the fabled Cox de Leon. They're very stiff very glassy and they suit feelers and tails of dry flies and things like that they're superb for that sort of thing just take away the excess like that and we're in business now that represents all those hairy bits that stick out of the front of the shrimp now it's not absolutely necessary to give the particular creature eyes but we will do that because an exaggeration in a fly is better than an exact copy. A caricature usually catches more fish than something that is too exact. I did a figure eight turn there on those two links and we will cut it off with the tinsel shears. Don't use your scissors. Now, unless we put a dab of instant glue there, the whole dressing will turn round on the shank and we don't need that. So a little bit of instant glue there we are. We'll firm that up. Now, in clear water fishing, it is necessary 
most of the time to use heavily weighted nymphs. Now there's enough weight on there for normal fishing. Now if we want to extend the weight, if you like, we take a bit of lead wire and we wrap the lead wire round the shank. Now, uh, people will tell you that this immediately means your fly is going to swim upside down. Yes, it will. And that is an advantage in the case of the shrimp. Because you fish the shrimp close to weed beds. And the fact that you reverse the fly tends to make it weedless. We secure that lead wire with a wrap of thread and bring it back. Now we're going to tie in the back. And for this, any plastic will do, PVC, polythene, anything of that sort. I'm using a special one here called Spectra Flash. It comes from Austria and it gives a nice glistening appeal to the fly. If you look at that, you can see the, the shine on that. I've cut a strip off and we're going to tie it in on the top here in front of the eyes. Here we go. That'll be secured. Now, in order to give the natural segmentation of the little crustacean body, we're going to need some nylon. Good, honest nylon. There we are. Just a short length. And we tie that in. Just take the thread down the body to make that rib absolutely secure because it can be a right pig. If you've tied in the rib, and you've gone through all the other procedures and when it comes to tie the rib in, it pulls out. You are what is termed politely a snookered. There are other words to describe it. Now a bit of grey fur. Any grey fur, even grey wool will do for this pattern as long as you can tease it out. This fur, incidentally, comes from the tail of a dormouse. Now, everybody will be up in arms and say, oh, the dormouse is a protected animal. Not in the Mediterranean countries, it isn't. It is a pest of the fruit crops. And in Yugoslavia in particular, 200,000 are trapped annually. Now, we have dubbed the fur onto the thread and we're wrapping it round. We dub a little bit more. The secret of dubbing is to hold it with your thumb and finger, press onto the thread, and just twist in one direction until you form this little, little rope. There you are, look. And we wind it down to the back of the fly and finish. Now we're going to put the back on. We just lift this plastic strip over, holding it thumb and finger, take the thread over, and trap it. A few turns will secure. This is the beauty of this bobbin holder. It adds weight so you don't completely have to do half hitches after every turn of thread. Here we go. Cut that off there. The last procedure, the rib. We take the rib over and pull tight. And again, pull tight. And again, Twist it, pull tight. And again, twist it, pull tight. Holding it thumb and finger, tie it off. Now that we've secured the rib, which gives the natural segmentation of the body, there you, are, you can see the little lumps, we have to do a whip finish. It's easily done with the fingers thus. A dab of varnish now will seal all our work and thus secure the fly. And just a little tip, clear that eye. And there's nothing worse on a wet, windy day trying to thread nylon through an eye of a blocked up hook. Now the real use of a dubbing needle is not to put varnish as I just done, but to pick out fur and we pick out the fur to simulate the legs. There we are. 
What could be easier than that? Let's see if Pete Cockle can catch one of his big trout on that. This is Abington, and we're here on the first leg of the fishery, on a beautiful summer's day. There's damsels flitting across the surface, bags of insect activity. And uh, I've tied on Taft's copy of the shrimp to a five pound leader, which should just about see us right for these conditions. Water is absolutely gin clear. And if we pull down the Polaroids, and bring the hat over to get some shade. We should be able to see absolutely everything in the water. These clear water fisheries let you target individual trout because you can see the whole fish, everything about it, everything you need to do. Watch the reactions of the fish to the fly. You can see it take the whole lot. We'll take a walk along the fishery and just see what there is around today. I can see a couple of fish going through. They, they're both around two pounds, but they are chasing each other. Always makes it a bit hard to catch fish like that. See, so look, they're going through quite quickly, one behind the other, hardly worth casting to, in fact. What we want is a, a fish that's well settled and feeding quite happily. Now then, out there, the fish looks maybe three, four pounds. And see? Takes a nymph, big white flash of the mouth. Beautiful. That fish is quite happy. It's well settled, it's feeding all the time. I reckon he's probably flushing out shrimps from the weed. There he goes, look. Another flash of the mouth. Superb looking trout too. move on, see if there's anything else around. It's lovely being able to see the, into the water as clear as this, pick out individual trout. Now, that looked like a shadow moving over there. We'll keep going, just see if it was a trout or not. Yeah. Coming into view, under the shade of that tree, there's a very, very good fish. I wonder, what's he up to? Swimming around quite purposefully. And there it goes, bang, the flash of the mouth, so he's on the go. Lovely looking fish. All the fins are bristling. It's all on the feed. Nice active trout, easy one. Or is it? I wonder, we'll have it go. See what we can make of this one. Get the fly out in the water. And pull some line off. And we'll give him a try, or her, probably a female this one, it's a big fish, seven or eight pounds I should think. Try and drop this fly in front of its path, let it sink a little, to try to intercept her and see if she will come after the fly. There's a small fish coming after it, which I'm going to get to chase it and pull it out of the way to clear that little fish. There she goes. Right. Now we can go after the big one. Hopefully, if she's still out there. Right, there she is. Let's see if that cast will go over the fish and hopefully she'll spot the fly. No, totally ignored it that time. Let's have another go and put it in front of her. Now that dropped nicely. Will she see it? Yes, she's coming. Here she comes. Come on. Come on. Mouth open. Come on. You light, took it short. Try her again. <laughs> Once more with that particular fly. And she's turned now. She's coming. Here she comes. Come on. There she goes. 
That looks quite a good fish. And it's also a bit angry. Very understandably. All right, just settle down and let me get the line back on the reel so that I don't do something silly like standing on it. And now you can go. These big fish can really pull hard. And I always try to get them to keep their head well up in the water so that they don't get too far away from me. And then you've got the upper hand. You can see by the bend in the rod the pressure that you have to put on to stop the things. And in heavy weed situations, I'd probably put even more on. There's a tail rolling up. Beautiful great tail she's got. think you're taking the steam out every so often and then off they go again. Looks to be about seven pounds I should think, maybe a little more. Getting ready, we'll start to take the net off. Get the net in the water ready. Still on an even keel, this fish. It's only just beginning to slightly roll occasionally. So you're not really ready yet. Now, if I get down in the reeds and keep low, I may be able to get her to come in over the top of the net. Maybe not. Always a danger time, this for the big fish when they come in to close range. That's when you can easily lose them by just being a little bit too eager. Come on then, on her side, coming over and in, yes. How's that for a beautiful rainbow? Look at that, beautiful in the sunshine. Rods for this style of fishing don't need to be necessarily very powerful, but what they must have is a through action. We're not aiming for distance, so you don't need a tip action rod, but the through action rod will cushion the shocks of playing a fish, maybe a heavy fish, in confined circumstances. You want a rod somewhere in the region of a seven or an eight rating go much lighter down to say a four or a five and you find it very difficult to control a fish at close range. Something around the nine foot range in choice of materials is yours, carbon or glass or boron, doesn't matter a lot. On the end of the rod obviously we have to have a reel. And here again, tremendous choice, but what they must have is a good drag mechanism. Very important to avoid an overrun situation if a fish suddenly plunges away hard. The reel should stop revolving as soon as you stop pulling line off it. Now, frankly, any of the um, leader range are perfectly adequate. You get them from around 12 pounds upwards, perfectly adequate reels. I nowadays use this System 2 reel, which has got a, the most amazing drag system I've ever used. Uh, it's just a per matter of personal preference loaded onto the reel, it's a fly line. For this game you're going to need two lines to get you through most circumstances. A double taper floater, double taper means you can be very accurate, and a slow sink line, say a weight forward, to get a little bit more range where you may need to get a fly down deeper into the water to hold it down. Colour fly lines, well, amazing range of colours. Floating lines, I don't think it matters a scrap what colour you use. I've yet to see any evidence that it frightens a fish, no matter what colour I'm using. Sinking lines, well, you need something really that's going to blend in with the surroundings, so go for greens or browns. 
which is what most of them are made in anyway. And then the end of the fly line comes the leader. Now here you must knot it securely to the fly line in a neat, simple knot. This is a needle knot. Very simple, no problems with it. it slides through the rod rings with no fuss or bother at all. I normally use a continuous taper leader knotted to the fly line and then on the end of that put a short length of tippet material of around say five or six pounds braking strain. Don't go lighter, you're asking for a lot of trouble in water like this. There are a number of other items of tackle which are essential for this style of fishing. And if you remember that we must always travel light and mobility is important, then one of the most essential items is a good waistcoat. So you can carry all the little bits and pieces that you're going to need. Scissors, priest in the back pocket, fly box, spools of nylon for tippet material, and all the other little odds and sods you're going to need for a day's fishing. Good landing net is obviously very essential, and uh, you can have the type which clips onto a, a belt or a ring on your jacket, or this style of net which I use mostly, which just goes over my back and is there, ready for use whenever I need it. Top pocket, a pair of Polaroids, the thing you cannot do without. These are optics used by virtually everyone in the clear water fishing line. Put those on and you can immediately see everything you need to in the water. But what you do really need is a bit of shade over the eyes. So, on with a good hat with a wide brim. And you're away, that's all you need. You need to be very observant and have a lot of patience when looking for individual trout. You've got to make the most of every possible light angle, area of shade, any, any little possibility where there may be a fish. There's a nice one out there in fact. Right, fish at long range are quite good fun because you can see them a long, long way out. It's difficult to work out how deep they actually are in the water. And uh, when you start the retrieve, you never be sure if a little one's going to come flashing in from the side that you haven't yet seen. But a big fish hooked at long range is great fun to play. In calm, sticky conditions like this, you really do have to let the line and leader get under the surface. I'm using an intermediate line so that it just sinks, but it, it does avoid all problems with line wake, which are very important. Some of these big fish have seen all sorts of flies put at them and they're easily spooked by seeing a line cut across the surface. There's a fish. Lovely. Look at that. Really long way out. 
What's he doing now? Kiting back in towards me as fast as he can go. And off again. When there's a lot of weed about like this, you really do have to keep the rod way up so you don't foul too much of it. I hope you can keep the fish's head up as well. Landing the big fish is always the trickiest part of the whole operation. You never quite know if he's going to do a sudden last minute crash to get the net in the water, well sunk. Wait till the fish rolls on his side. I don't have too short a line. And then try to draw him across the top of the net when he's on his side. Coming over now. Pull him into the bag of the net and then slide the net up the bank. That way you don't risk him flopping out and breaking the landing net handle as well. Yeah, beautiful fish. Now the kindest thing to do is kill him straight away. No messing around. One good hard thump on the back of the head, like that. And there we have one superb rainbow trout. How's that? A lovely trout. Take the fly out, all covered in weed. This is the rest of the line. Now, to keep the fish nice and fresh, you pop them in the water on a stringer. And then we've got no problems with it drying out and looking horrible at the end of the day. Just slip that through the gill plates. Clip it together. And pop them in the water. There. Collect that one later in the day. Cast into individual fish on small waters does demand a reasonable degree of accuracy and for that you must have good line control in the air. Try to practice getting the rod to stop at that near vertical position. So the loop on the back cast which you can see against the trees stays nice and narrow and out goes a fly in a dead straight line, exactly where you want it. Leader length and makeup is also critical in that if you have a very short leader, there's really no way you can put the fly down with any degree of delicacy. It's going to almost inevitably land with a wallop. And conversely, if you have the leader far too long, then you can't get any control over it, as we're using, most of the times, leaded nymphs, which will act something like a pendulum on the back cast if the leader is too long. So we're looking really for a leader around about the nine or 10 foot mark, slightly over the actual length of the rod. And with that makeup, you've then got good control and good presentation.
when you retrieve, try to aim for a, a slow, steady retrieve using this semi-figure of eight style, but keep the rod tip right down touching the water. And then you can react very rapidly to anything you see out there. If you see a fish take the fly, you can hit it immediately. Whereas if you've got the rod up like this, you've got this big loop of line hanging down, which you've got to straighten up before you can actually hit on the fish. It's much better on any form of retrieve in this style of fishing to keep the rod tip right down low in the water. But it does keep you dead in contact with the fish and you can hit it straight away like that. Not all fishing on small clear waters is about nymph fishing and in fact today we're here at the small pool on the western fishery at Albury in Surrey which is reserved for dry fly and nymph only and we're going to show just how effective dry fly fishing can be when using light tackle, a small short rod with a number three or four line and fishing a dry sedge to fish which we can see cruising out over the weed beds. You can see that the weeds almost reach the surface in many places with quite deep gullies between them where the trout are cruising around just on the lookout for whatever they can find. What we're going to try and do is drop the dry fly in the path of one of those cruising fish and hope that he'll just intercept it. You need to be pretty accurate for this sort of target fishing with a dry fly. Ah, look at that, just refused it. Must have been something slightly wrong there. Let's try again. And, oh, it's on, lovely. And a brown. God, what a beautiful fish. They always fight differently from rainbows. Gorgeous trout, I love brownies. I bet that'll go all the three pounds. When you're dry fly fishing, you can very often induce a take by giving the fly a little twitch as it lies on the surface of the water just enough to provoke their interest while they're cruising around on the lookout for something to eat. In clear waters you'll most often find that the tape comes just as the fly touches the surface of the water. Ah, there it is! Oh, look at that. Typical acrobatic fight from a really fit summer rainbow. They're beautiful fish this time of the year.
There are a great many clear water fly fisheries throughout the length and breadth of this country. This one, in fact, is Chalk Springs at Arundel in Sussex. Very picturesque water, and one which is noted for its very large brown trout among its very good quality rainbows. Incidentally, the browns can be extremely frustrating when you're trying to catch them. I'm going to hand over today to Gary Brooker, who's going to put into practice some of the ideas I've been putting forward in this video. There indeed is one of Chalk Springs' very large brown trout. I wonder how Gary will get on with that one. Incidentally, you will see that we've both worn quite light clothing throughout this video, uh, whereas normally we would be very drably dressed so as not to frighten the fish. But for the purposes of the video, we had to be able to be seen and to stand out quite clearly. Right, I'll hand over to you, Gary. Best of luck. Thanks, Peter. After fly fishing for a few seasons from the banks of reservoirs, and peaty or muddy lakes, where the water clarity was not so good, it was a real eye-opener when I first fished a clear water fishery. With the Polaroids on, you can for a start see if you're covering any fish, and if you haven't spotted one to cast to, you'll certainly see if one comes from the depths and shows any interest in your fly. <laughs> or not. Well, that fly's been refused a few times, so let's change the pattern. I find it helps if the fly is of a visible colour, or if you're going to use a dark pattern, try and get one with a bright head or a bright tail. It certainly helps me to see where my fly is in relation to the fish at any time. Oh, look at that! I was so engrossed in tying that mayfly nymph on securely, a big browns cruise right up the lake past me. I've met a few anglers who've expressed surprise after their first time in clear waters, and they've seen what the trout are actually up to whilst they were thrashing around. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but the old ticker starts racing when these fish start chasing. And if it's a good size, it's very hard to keep calm and to do everything right. Well, that big fish was under the bank and he's come out and had a look, but he turned me down. Exciting though. Well, there's another one coming to have a look. Oh, now he's turned off. Never mind, pop it out again. That's better. Well, he's seen it. Yeah, and he's turned. He's following. The old ticker's going. Here he comes. Oh, got it! Whew. Peter will be pleased. Pretty nice rainbow. Ah, uh, watch out for that weed. Oh, it's in there, but... Oh, not so bad. Bit of Murphy's Law, that, I think. There's a problem around, bound to get stuck in it. Incidentally, I found these browns in this lake a lot less aggressive than the rainbow that we've got here. Certainly on the day, you could put a fly in front of the brown's nose and just totally ignore it. I think the next time I'm out having to go for browns, I'm going to try letting a brown trout find the fly all on its own. Maybe leave it static or something. I'll certainly try an unweighted uh, natural pattern. I'll ask Pete what he thinks. Now, I love all types of fly fishing. From reservoir boat, on a river, if you're lucky enough to get on a good stretch. But these smaller still waters are certainly providing a lot of anglers with some good sport. But in clear waters, certainly I've found that a day full of chases and missed takes can be just as exciting as successfully matching the hatch somewhere or a bag full in a couple of hours. But today these fish were pretty interested 
And we've got a nice fish here to take home for the barbecue. Here, is it? There we are, a successful and very pleasant day out. Fish like these are the rewards of clear water trout fishing and I hope from watching this video that you will have seen something of the way the fish behave in the water, their reactions to the fly and some of the tactics we use to catch them and that you will now be able to go on yourself and catch some better fish.